the, the things that are truly new, I'm going to be in trouble with somebody for saying this, but most of the things that are truly new are either not truly necessary. They're, they're put there because we are fascinated with odd mechanisms and this is something different, or they are something that was never achievable before the materials or the technology to make it came along. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 70 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting. And hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, and anyone who loves knives. And I'll add that's in the knife industry and definitely have someone that is uh, deep into the knife world with our guest today, Bob. Uh, yeah, we're talking to Mark Zaleski. He's the editor of Knife Magazine and the author of A Sure Defense, The Bowie Knife in America. Now, Mark Zaleski's been around the knife world for a long time. He's been a knife writer for a long time, and uh, he's a renowned expert in the Bowie knife, so I was very excited to get him on the show. As you know, Jim, the Bowie knife is just about the, the pinnacle to me. Well, definitely uh, someone knowledgeable uh, not only about knives, but uh, the knife world, the knife industry, but uh, putting together a publication and a website, just uh, you know, kind of curating all the content from the knife world and uh, you know, we've we've got memberships and uh, see the magazine. It's just uh, just really nice, really really gorgeous. Yeah, and uh, Mark has a vast collection with sub collections, wh which I l really love. You know, if he's he has uh, one main uh, sort of collecting subject for a while, so that he doesn't tire of that, or so that he doesn't exhaust his resources there. He's also looking for other things and other kinds of knives. Uh, for his sub collections. So I love hearing about a collector that's got sub collections. You know, it seems like we all have at least one collection, if not multiple. So uh, categorize them collection, exactly. sub collection, sub collection A1. Sub, you know. <laughs> exactly. Lots of gaps to fill. Our uh, podcast today, I want to remind you, is uh, sponsored by Audiobooks Now. Listening has never been more convenient and affordable, and you can get 50% off your first audiobook by just going to theknifejunkie.com slash audiobooks. That's with an S on the end. Start reading, or shall we say listening, today. Save 50% off your first audiobook. That's at theknifejunkie.com slash audiobooks. And I'm sure a lot of uh, Christmas gifts will involve uh, things that can be used to listen to audiobooks. So uh, now is a good time to uh, get that 50% savings by going to thenifejunkie.com slash audiobooks. Also, before we get into the uh, interview, I want to remind folks, go to thenifejunkie.com slash subscribe. That way you can subscribe not only to the podcast, if you happen to be listening on uh, the YouTube channel where we put the podcast, or maybe on the website, you can subscribe and get it in your podcast player. But also that knifejunkie.com slash subscribe page also uh, gives you a chance to subscribe to the Knife Junkie newsletter. So two things to do right there on that subscribe page. So theknifejunkie.com slash subscribe. Do you carry multiple knives? Then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. I'm here with Mark Zaleski, editor of Knife Magazine and author of A Sure Defense, The Bowie Knife in America, among many other books and articles. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. You're very welcome. I'm pleased to be here. Well, you're known throughout the industry as being an expert, a uh, preeminent expert on older antique uh, knives and weapons. Describe your expertise when it comes to knives and swords and these kind of things. Oh, uh, expertise is related to expert, which is a word that terrifies me just a little bit. Um you know, they say about an expert that it's uh, any anybody more than 50 miles from home or uh, uh, that that sort of thing, uh, a former spurt, a drip under pressure, all those kind of things. I'm, uh, you know, I, I started out collecting antique pocket knives many years ago and then uh, American hunting knives. And uh, my father is a collector of military knives for a while. So I've, I've got a little of that, British and American. And uh, uh, antique Bowie knives are, have been my primary 
collecting focus for a, a, a large a, a lot of years. Um, antique straight razors are, are another thing mm. I pursue, and uh, to a degree, medical instruments and uh, things like that. All right. So before we get into talking about your work as an editor for, to me, the most uh, beautifully produced knife magazine out there. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Tell me what you think this um, fascination with edged things are. I mean, you mentioned straight razors, and to me, yeah, uh, a straight razor with um, uh, with tortoise shell uh, handles and a nice big f- wide blade to me is a just an inherently beautiful thing. Even though I shave with a with a Mach three when I do. <laughs> so, what is it about edged things? I'm not sure what it is about edge things, but there's a certain appeal to them, I suppose, and that they're inherently a, a little bit dangerous. But uh, I, I think that as far as uh, historical objects go, that any object that that is you know, legitimately historical, it, it has the potential to connect one directly to the objects of the past, to the events of the past and to historical events that mean something in the history of uh, our area or our country, our, our families or events that we may personally be interested in. So if you, uh, if you think world war two is a fascinating thing, you know, you don't just have to read about it in a book. You can go purchase an object that participated in world war two. Um, and you know, if it's straight razors, it could be the straight razor that, that your great grandfather shaved with or others like that. One of my personal fascinations among straight razors is they presented a, a, a beautiful surface, a nice flat surface, which could be etched. And they were frequently etched with uh, the events of the times, patriotic and political and, and things like that. So they are very directly tied to the events uh, of history. Were those meant to be used, those razors etched with historical events? Oh, absolutely. They, they were meant to be used, but the reason they're on there is that they're meant to be sold. And these things yes, were made in, yes. in, uh, in England for the, uh, for the most part. And, and they were etched with these things because it would help sell them. And it was a, an easy and inexpensive way to decorate them. So you started as a kid collecting. Uh, I know for some reason you bristle at the term slip joints. Uh, I read oh. an article, but <laughs> okay. So, so you started as a kid collecting, <laughs> let's see, uh, traditional pattern knives. There we go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so where did that? How did that fascination, uh, you know, bud and explain to me how how it grew? Oh, uh, it, it was very simple, but uh, probably unusual for most of us in this hobby. You know, um, without dragging the story out too awful long. My my grandfather was a, a collector of things like single shot rifles and frequented the gun shows back in the day. And when my father got out of the Navy in the late 60s, uh, the, the government was just all too eager to, to implement the Gun Control Act of 68, hmm. which dissuaded my father from collecting firearms. And subsequently, he discovered knives and thought military knives would be a good thing to collect. And, uh, you know, when I was born shortly thereafter, my mother decided that we couldn't have all those killing knives in the house with her baby, namely me. <laughs> so uh, the, the military knives moved on and then there were pocket knives and there were hunting knives and then there were bowie knives and then there were folding knives like bowie knives. And this progression of things created a, a small but useful library and, a, and a, a good base knowledge of information in my household tutor. So when I became old enough to go to the gun show and my father didn't want to have a kid in tow and I threw a fit uh, so that I would be allowed to go because I didn't get to see my dad that much at the time, uh, I was being drugged through the gun shows in in, uh, in Iowa where I grew up uh, from the time I was five years old. And knives were something I could, uh, you know, purchase and trade for and that sort of thing. I, I, d- I dug in everybody's junk boxes and bought things and we took them home and, you know, cleaned them up a little bit and I'd take them back and trade them for more. And I, I, I've done that ever since I was a kid. Like a currency for you. Like it was a currency for me. It, and it, you know, soon became a source of income for, for me. So as a kid at that age, when you were just first going to those gun shows and hunting out deals and finding, yeah. finding knives, what was your ideal at the time? Uh, what was the ideal knife you had in mind for the perfect score. Well, 
you know, you're, you're fascinated with the things you read about in books. And so the, you know, the books I was looking at were Peterson's American Knives 1958, which had all kinds of, of wonderful historic knives in it and Bowie knives and other things. And, oh, uh, books like Knife Makers of Old San Francisco and the California Knives. But, uh, I was particularly interested in, um, in American pocket knives and things like that at that time. And so, uh, was very influenced by Dewey Ferguson's Romance of Knife Collecting, second edition, 1970, and the pocket knives in there. And, and eventually, um, I became interested particularly in the, the hunting knives of Webster Marble and, and the Marble Arms and Manufacturing Company. Uh, I, the, the first really good knife I acquired as, as a kid was, uh, a marble safety folding hunter in wonderful condition. Uh, when I was uh, roughly nine years old. And at that time, that knife was worth about 125 or 150 mm -hmm. or $175. This is a really good knife. So well, I've got one. I'm going to collect these. And, um, I built that collection and finally sold it when I was about, I don't know, 20, 28, 29, 30. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and turned that into, uh, uh, quite a number of, of Bowie knives. Wait, des describe what that marbles uh, looks like. Well, that, the particular marbles I'm referring to is Safety Folding Hunter. I wrote a very extensive article on those back in uh, 2002. It's available on our website. Uh, it, it's a knife with a blade longer than the handle, and it has a, 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 a lengthy extension that sticks out the end that when you open the blade fully, this extension folds in place to lock the blade. The, it has a folding guard associated with it. It was invented in 1902 by a fellow named Milton H. Rowland, who was a leather worker who worked for marbles. And it, uh, there are, gosh, there are at least 30 variations of those over the years. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating knife, very well made. And they, you know, they have been considered top collectibles for, a, for a long, long time. What marbles was mostly known for were, you know, very high quality hunting knives, fixed blade hunting knives and the, the safety axe with the folding guard. And, and so those are the things I collected for many, many years. What, what was the purpose of the folding hunter uh, with the, with the oversized blade? What was the purpose of making that knife? The purpose of making, well, you know, folding hunters were very popular among hunters. I mean, a lot of people had fixed blades, but if, if you wanted a knife that was a little more portable, or maybe you had a large fixed blade and wanted a, a smaller knife that you kept just for the, the skinning of the game or, or whatever, you know, they sold lots of those. And uh, there are different shapes. You have the, the Coke bottle shape. We have the, you know, sort of the rat tail European inspired shape, like a K65 pattern, uh, you know, that came along. But the one that Webster Marble designed combined and they sold two different sizes but they it combined a fairly short handle with a longer blade so you could get a longer blade in a sort of a smaller package it was simple to manufacture it didn't have the complex locking mechanism that some other things had and yet it was an it, it was an extremely strong locking mechanism and it you know it had this folding guard it, it was complex it was cool it was really well made they weren't cheap uh, but it was, you might say, a, a quite advanced hunting knife for the time, folding hunting knife. I remember the first time I saw one of those. Uh, it was uh, in my adolescence uh, at some point, and I remember loving the swing guard, you know, mm -hmm. because it reminded yes. me of an Italian stiletto with the <laughs> yes. swing guard. So I thought that that must be an extra cool knife. Actually, uh, Jim, the producer of this show, uh, bought um, – it wasn't a marbles, but he bought uh, some great folding hunter like that. And I cleaned it up for him, and uh, he resold it and made a made a nice little uh, nice little purse there. Uh, but it was that same sort of thing, you know uh, the the short handle, the long blade. You fold it, and it, and just in holding it, it, it made me wonder. You could probably use just the tip of the blade as it is folded in, just for small tasks, and then when you need to dress out game or something like that, open it up fully. The, the marbles had the, the tip of the blade protected, uh, but oh, I've okay. seen other types that, that didn't do that. And yes, you could certainly do that. And this is a design. This is not a, I mean, I say Milton Rowland invented it in 1902, but like a lot of things and even patents today that I say that, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, the English were making knives like that in the 1830s. Uh, the, the French were making them in the, in the late 1700s. Uh, of that basic concept with the blade that is longer than the handle and locks in both positions. 
Right. Okay. So I mentioned uh, at the outset that you wrote a book called A Sure Defense, The Bowie Knife in America. and Co-wrote, actually. Co-wrote. And uh, so you're a bit of an expert on the subject, and I happen to love Bowie knives and the, and the clip clip shape, uh, clip point shape and, and the whole nine yards. And there's a lot of um, lore that goes into the Bowie knife that oh, yes. I, I, I sort of know uh, that I can sort of hold on to, but I'd love to hear more about. But before we do, one thing I can't help but notice is that uh, the Bowie knife is, is known for that clip uh, pointed blade. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've seen that shape before, before Jim Bowie. We saw that in history in the past. Like, <laughs> what, where, where does it come from and how, how did it come to be, uh, sort of ascribed to the Bowie knife? Oh, who the heck knows? You know, I mean, that, the, the clip, the clip pointed blade goes back to the sacks. Uh, I may go further back than that. Who knows? Again, there is nothing new under the sun and knives. That's not quite true. Every once in a while, I'll be running around shot show and see something. He's like, well, Never seen that before, but <laughs> most of those, the, the things that are truly new, I'm going to be in trouble with somebody for saying this, but most of the things that are truly new are either not truly necessary. They're, they're put there because we are fascinated with odd mechanisms and this is something different, or they are something that was never achievable before the materials or the technology to make it came along. So there, there are things that, um, that, and again, they're, they're there for, uh, those of us who like gadgets, which I love gadgets. I love knives with goofy mechanisms, but <laughs> I, I, years ago, I, I really offended a, a Japanese designer by making a parallel to his brand new design, you know, to a, a press button knife company, a switchblade in the 1890s. I said, well, you know, it's similar to this design. It was patented in 1892 by George Trade. And I, I did not even realize what I was doing, that I'd just, you know, blown up his, his new invention and he was not very happy with it. Disgraced me. But, his but, family. But, you know, <laughs> you know it, uh, I, I suppose that, you know, if, if you're a designer today and you want to, you know, create new design, I'll tell you where to go find them is go, go look in the patent indexes from, from way <laughs> back when. And there are tons of things out there. All, all these things are, are, are old before they, they were ever the, you know, new modern stuff. Then describe how we got the Bowie as we know it today and, and, and Bowie buoy. <laughs> If you're in the South, it's definitely Bowie. Definitely if you're in the North, we might cut you some slack. <laughs> um, the, the, the Bowie is a really interesting, the, the development is really interesting and, um, it, uh, takes on, let me, let me step back a little bit. The, the, the Bowie knife is something that um, that we've all read about a little bit, and it's been written about many times historically. And as I grew up reading the the work of uh, Bill Williamson and uh, Bernard Levine and all these wonderful researcher writers who came before me, and uh, Bob Abels and, and and such, you know, you you come away with an idea of of what the history was. Uh, when I was charged with uh, coordinating this buoy exhibit, uh, curating this buoy exhibit at Historic Arkansas Museum that led to the production of the book. It really, the book is an, a catalog of the exhibit. Um, but uh, they said, well, if you're, we're going to do a book on this exhibit, then what we want to do is we want to have two scholarly essays. So well, I can write a scholarly essay and it's footnoted. <laughs> and it's, it's, so what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to take on the evolution of the buoy knife. And, and you go in with preconceived notions based on what the previous writers have have put together and and put out there and i went back to the source material and researched it myself and i came away with some um with some interesting observations and some very different opinions than i had uh, putting together that exhibit turned out to be the most educational thing i've i've ever done on on Bowie knives it caused me to go back and prove to myself what i thought i knew and and a lot of that i really didn't know and I'm I'm not sure how many other people did. The Bowie knife, you know, came about as a result of the sandbar fight in, in 1827. Of course we know this, and there weren't very many witnesses to the sandbar fight, but it was covered uh by a few accounts in the newspaper, and those accounts 
uh, some of them anyway, were copied from newspaper to newspaper and, and that way spread across the country. But the, the entire description in that event was, uh, you know, that Bowie removed a, a large butcher knife. And that's it. That's, it's a large butcher knife in, in the most common account. And none of the other accounts are any more detailed than that. So these, illu- these, these articles did not have illustrations and all they ever said was a large butcher knife. And in my estimation, the, the Bowie knife was not an immediate fad that, that stemmed from 1820. So we have one account that said all the steel in the country was immediately converted <laughs> into Bowie knives. Uh, yeah. but, but it turns out it, it took, you know, a while for us to dig out where they came from. It came from an 1836 newspaper, not an 1827 newspaper. Um, so. What really happened, I think, is a slow development of the Bowie knife. And the Bowie developed by being produced by craftsmen across the country based on whatever they saw or whatever they thought would be a suitable sidearm um, based on their own history. So the Germans produced things that look kind of like German Bowie knives and the, 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 the makers with French backgrounds that produced things that kind of look like French butcher knives. And we had the influence of the Scottish Dirk and the, the Mediterranean Dirk and all these things. It, you know, as the, as America is a great melting pot, it was a melting pot of immigrant cutlers and, and all of their influences were used in, independently to create mm-hmm. different styles of Bowie knives. And, and some of them we believe we can trace across the country where this knife went from Arkansas to Cincinnati and we see knives in Cincinnati like it. And then he may have gone hmm. to New York and we see a knife in New York like that. And then there was Tachi who had a knife like that on his belt. And then he went to Washington in 37 and oh, wait, we got a knife in Washington like that. So it's an interesting evolution. Let's back up one second. Uh, we talked, you, you talked about the sandbar fight. You kind of yes. breezed over that. Tell people what that's all about. Oh, don't ask me to go into detail in the sandbar fight. I'm a knife guy and, and, and not a Jim <laughs> Bowie guy. I, you know, uh, uh, essentially the, the sandbar fight and, um, I'm sure we can pr- provide you with a link, but the, the best thing out there on the sandbar fight, if you have no background on it mm-hmm. and are interested in it, there are two YouTube videos that are narrated uh, by a great friend of mine named Jack Ed Edmondson, who is a, a, an expert on uh, these sort of things. And uh, por- he portrays Jim Bowie in both of them, I believe. Uh, but the, the sandbar fight uh, amounted to a, a duel between two rival parties, political, and there were, I think there was, was some... Uh, uh, I think there were some women involved somewhere along the way. And uh, anyway, there was, a, there was a duel held by parties from Mississippi who, to conduct this duel and keep it out of Mississippi's jurisdiction, went across the river from Louisiana. They were in Louisiana, crossed the river to Natchez, Mississippi. And the first island above Natchez was, was where this, uh, duel was held. And, and so the, the, the parties, that were uh, were set to duel, brought their their doctors and brought their seconds and brought the, all the other people in their party, and they fired two shots at each other and missed and shook hands and uh, started to walk off the field uh, as friends. You know, um, in the meantime, the seconds who were all at war with each other decided to settle their differences, and uh, uh, two of them started shooting at, at Jim Bowie, who uh, ultimately survived. I think. We decided uh, seven stabs with a sword Ooh. cane and and uh, two shots. One of was one of which was, I believe, through his chest, um, and uh, uh, disemboweled one adversary and ran the other one off by slashing him with a Bowie knife. And uh, he was uh, he was extremely ill for the next few months, but he he eventually recovered and uh, you know found his way to the Alamo. We are not descended from weak men, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, but the the story of the fight did kind of capture the imagination. But I, mm-hmm. I'm not so sure uh, exactly the role that it had to do with spreading the popularity of these knives. You know, the, the Bowie knife was not the first knife used for self defense anywhere in the world, or even in mm-hmm. America. Dirks were extremely popular before then. They were. They were con- considered kind of a sleazy weapon, you know. You, uh, <laughs> you, you carried this little concealed dirk, and you know, if, if someone you know aggravated you, you pulled out this weapon um, that the uh, uh, that your adversary might not be suspicious of, and stick him with it and run off, right? Uh, so the Bowie knife was essentially a larger version 
of the Dirks that had already been popular for, for decades before that. So you left off saying, uh, before I asked you about the sandbar fight, you were talking about how Bowie, I'm from Ohio, but I'm going to say Bowie right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Good job. How, how the, the Bowie is descended from kind of a, a different ethnographic takes from different cutlers. Yes. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned the French Bowie and I thought, hmm, French. And then, and then it, it, it occurred to me, it's, uh, that's the kind of knife where, where the blade is the guard. You know, instead of having a guard protruding across it, it does look a little bit more like a, a chef's knife. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's that's the Searle style, the style we refer to as the straight back style in the book, because I hadn't heard anybody put a name to it other than Searle style. Uh, mm -hmm. And those came out of Louisiana. Daniel Searle's was I can't even remember his ancestry. He wasn't French. But by the time he made the knife, he, he was in an area with a very strong French influence. So how did the Bowie actually happen? Uh, did Jim Bowie, uh, he commissioned this knife, right? Oh, no. Um, well, we don't know a lot of it. You know what? And, and the first question you must ask, is you, if you say, what is the first Bowie knife? You say, well, which one? Do you mean the, <laughs> you know, is the first Bowie knife, the knife that was at the sandbar fight that was described as a, a large butcher knife? Well, it could be that one. Or, you know, maybe that was the part, that was the event that, that named the Bowie knife. So, uh, so maybe the next knife he got, he got maybe a dressed up version of that. And so maybe that's the first Bowie knife. Or, you know, you could consider the, the knife he, he preferred the most might be the, the, you know, the real Bowie knife. Or maybe the first knife that was ever called a Bowie knife. Hmm. Because that's another thing. You know, the term Bowie knife doesn't appear in 1827 or 28 or 29 or 30. And not in any quantity. We have a couple of weird quotes, but really we start to see the term come into common use in late 1835 and into 1836. And the term becomes popular after the fall of the Alamo. All of that being said, how is it defined? If you were asked today, uh, if, if someone came up to you and handed you a knife and said, is this a Bowie knife? You would evaluate it and you would say yes or no because of what? I think there are different definitions that apply to different people in different situations. And this is something um, that my co-author on the book, uh, Bill Worthen, uh, Historic Arkansas Museum curator, he and I debated this quite a bit. How do you define a Bowie knife? Because a lot of people say, oh, it's got a clip point blade and a big cross guard and that sort of thing. And, and you know, very quickly, if you try to define a knife by its style or by its size, you find that it doesn't work. You're, you're putting in exceptions to the rule constantly. And, you know, some of the most desirable Bowie knives of all are these rather small, guardless coffin Bowie knives. They don't have a guard. They don't, only a couple of them have clip points. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the blade might be five or six inches long. Yeah, There's yeah. one on the cover of next month's knife magazine, I might add, uh -huh. um, that, it, that is a pretty interesting one. And it, you know, if you define it by size, if you design it, if you define it by blade shape, if you say it has to have a guard, it's not a Bowie knife. But I'm telling you, it's a Bowie knife. Um, it was, it's referred to in a, an 1841 newspaper account as uh, one of the first Bowie knives. I, mean, I may have that quote off a little bit, but it's a, it, it, the, the way it was referenced referred to it as a, the original Bowie knife or something to that effect. So the way that we approach the definition of the Bowie knife was not to define it by style, but to define it by purpose. And in, in the sense of a his, of, of history, of a historical sense, we define it as a knife produced between 1827 and the Civil War for purposes of self-defense and or other things. Then you say, well, what about all the Bowie knives that have been produced since then? Well, now you're looking at something where we have to consider style uh, and size and, and that sort of thing to define a Bowie knife. But the, the, the perception of the Bowie knife uh, has definitely changed over the years. Not to say that, uh, you know, if you took a big clip point Bowie knife in 1840 and said, is this a Bowie knife? Oh, yeah, it was a Bowie knife, but a Bowie knife could have been a lot more than that or a lot different than that, a lot mm -hmm. smaller. Um, but but one thing for certain is that it was a, a knife to be used as a weapon. Now, with the Civil War and, and improved firearms production, the cartridge guns and that kind of thing, we had we had firearms that were reliable. You no longer needed to have a knife uh, with a 10-inch blade or a 12-inch blade or a 14-inch <laughs> blade. 
you know, because you weren't likely to stab someone. You, were, you weren't going to get any closer to your adversary than you had to be. So as a result, the, the Bowie knives of that time, as they were advertised, were uh, not always clip point, but often clip point blades of this style we're familiar with, uh, typically small. And the, the intended purpose was, was hunting. Not sure mm. they make very good hunting knives, but right. uh, but that was the the style popular as a hunting knife up until uh, things like the the Nesmuk and the Thistle Top Hunter and the Kephart and Webster Marble came along. Um, and that that's a whole other subject, the, the evolution of the sport hunting knife. But interest in Bowie knives came along again. It, it revitalized really with the, the production of Raymond Thorpe's book, uh, 1948, Bowie Knife, which is um, – a subject I probably shouldn't get very far down. It's in, it's in many ways a terrible book, uh, but it had a great deal to do with revitalizing interest in the Bowie knife, uh, helping to inspire the Iron Mistress, the book, and then oh. later the movie. And, uh, you know, Randall and eventually Moran and, and uh, Ruana and others produced uh, an awful lot of Bowie knives that were really inspired by Raymond Thorpe's book. That's that's interesting. I I was I was thinking you were going somewhere else. I thought you were going to say <laughs> that interest in the Bowie knife was rekindled by the proliferation of the K bar, because what an effective Bowie shaped kind of fighting slash utility or whatever else <laughs> knife you know to 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 proliferate the culture at that time anyway. Well, the the, the Bowie knife never went away. I mean, Webster Marble's uh, ideal is not that far removed from a Bowie knife. And the blade on that K-bar is a, like a seven inch ideal. It's really the, the fuller is a different size, but it's, it's a very similar blade shape. You know, the, the stacked leather handle on the K-bar comes from Webster marble too. Not that I'm not a Webster marble fan or anything. Actually, I'm a tremendous Webster marble fan, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but that's where a lot of those things came from. I, I read somewhere where you were saying most collectors have sort of a, a main, area or or focus but then little sub focuses and and in my in my way i i have the same thing in my knife collection tell me about yours i don't know if that's true of everyone but it's certainly true of me um you know i i have uh i have been a sort of a collector dealer all my life so i have i have things that in my head are inventory i guess and and I have uh, I have things that I collect and and so you know my my primary collecting focus is uh, American made Bowie knives of the mostly pre Civil War era with exceptions I, I like certainly like California knives uh, and then certain Civil War Bowies but um, you know related to that are are early American uh, lockback folding knives who really were folding dirk knives. Uh, which are quite rare uh, to come from America. Nearly all of them were English, mm -hmm. but I, I collect uh, I, I collect a lot of little things. And you know what I, what I found was that uh, as I got older and had a little more disposable income, and started collecting things that were rarer and more desirable and uh, more advanced, let's say. Um, it's not fun to go to a knife show and not come home with anything at all. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I found that I would be lucky to get a knife a year. So, uh, I started collecting little sub collections for a while. So maybe I collected, uh, I collected Warncliffe pattern knives for a mm -hmm. while. And I, mm -hmm. I collected, uh, uh, American made knives with exotic shell handles for a while. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd collected them and I wrote an article and eventually sold them off and moved on to something else. But <laughs> I, I think that, you know, and, and today we, we've got a collecting culture that, uh, has sort of gotten away from, from the shows, the show culture that I knew, uh, as I grew up and, and, and became a, a collecting adult. But you have to continue finding things, I think, in your quest or you get bored. Uh, and, and so I've collected other things to keep from being bored. It'd be, you know, besides, if you, if you collect things like, like I collect on the budget that I have, um, you better find some cheaper things or you're not going <laughs> to buy stuff very often. <laughs> so what are your, what are some of your sub, sub collections? So, uh, I, I already mentioned, uh, the early American lockback dirks. Dirk. Um, I, uh, I, I have a, a collection, I have a collection of straight razors ranging mm -hmm. from 
the, the early uh, English types and the, the large bladed types and that sort of thing, primarily English ones. Uh, but I, I developed a special focus within that on American patriotic and politically decorated razors. Uh, not that I'm a, 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 any sort of an authority on American history in a broad sense, uh, but I, I found that the direct connection to history to be very appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, I collect custom knives by some of the 70s makers and, and things that are historically inspired that I, I think are well done and I like. I, I, I don't even know what else. I've, I've got, you know, there's, oh, I have a few of these, and I have a few of those, <laughs> and I like this, and, and, and I like that. I like knives with goofy mechanisms, and so uh, Paul knives and Roloxes and, and, and stuff like that just, just sort of fascinate me. So uh, you have a magazine, Knife Magazine. You yes. You are editor of. Uh, how did this come about? How did you become editor of this magazine, and how does your natural, you know, in, inborn love for knives uh, feed this? Well, that was never a career path I expected to take, as you might imagine. Um, you know, growing up reading the knife magazines, I thought they were they were cool. Um, but, um, you know, I, I went to college to, to be an environmental chemist and uh, graduated and worked six months in the field and found out, you know, that this was a possibility and said, well, to heck with that. I'm, I'm going I'm going to go do something I love. Uh, essentially, um, you know, it, it sort of started with writing for the magazine. My father uh, wrote for uh, a few different publications over the years, uh, a, a little bit, Antique Trader, National Knife Magazine. Um, I think he had a piece published in Knife World. Uh, and and so when I was in college, I submitted my first article to, to Knife World, which is Knife Magazine's predecessor. Hmm. And uh, uh, Houston, uh, the, the editor, then called me up and uh, on the phone said, we want to put it on the cover of the next issue. And my, my head grew four sizes that day. <laughs> and and uh, he, he put it on there and encouraged me to write more. So I, I did write some more now and then and uh, as I had time. And um, when Houston was looking to retire, he sort of gave me a call one day and said, would you be interested? And, and it took a, a couple of years to get to that point. Uh, Spent about a year and a half as a full-time knife dealer, which I don't know that I could even pull that off today. But I, I certainly couldn't pull it off with the family today. But mm -hmm. at the time, I was able to do that. And uh, I, I came and, you know, uh, took the editor's chair here for about half of what I was making before. And it was sort of a natural fit, you know, to, to be able to do something related to, to what you love uh is uh, is priceless and um there there are not a lot of people that are that lucky and I, I try to never forget how lucky I am in that regard uh you know I I I spent this past weekend at the Civil War show in Franklin mm. Tennessee because all my Bowie collecting friends are there and I, I sent Clay up to Kentucky to the to, to the nice show up there so he he was working and I was playing and uh uh <laughs> That's that's good. He had fun too. So well, yeah. So <laughs> well, so uh, I look at Knife Magazine, and what sets it apart to me is the production. Well, the writing and the research is is amazing and incredibly thorough and well written. But uh, the magazine on the whole is is produced beautifully. It's big and mm -hmm. colorful. And uh, it, to you, what sets apart Knife Magazine's uh, Knife Magazine from the others? Well, I, I sort of glossed over our history, but, uh, you know, Knife Magazine is the successor to Knife World. Uh, Knife World was established in, in 1975 in St. Louis and, uh, you know, is a tabloid on newsprint. Uh, um, that's, that's the publication I wrote for when I was younger. That's the publication I took over, uh, as editor in, in 97. And, and then, um, when, when my boss Houston passed away at the end of uh, 2014, I, I purchased it. Uh, purchased the other half of it from the family and, um, did what I felt I, you know, the magazine always needed was turn it into a magazine. We, we were always magazine content. Uh, we felt the best content in the industry, but we mm -hmm. weren't pretty. So we, we essentially took Knife World and made it pretty. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a small staff here, but, you know, we're, we're pretty good at what we do. I, you know, I've been editing the magazine now for, coming up in a few months it'll be 23 years you know my my graphic artist kim just stepped back a little bit uh in her role this year and she'd been doing it since 
she's not listening. I think it's 1980 <laughs> for us. So she that makes her about 45. Oh, she's still a baby in arms. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Clay came on board last year with, with his experience, uh, over at the Truth About Knives blog. And, and this year we brought in a new graphic he's artist. He's a great who, writer, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. He, he's absolutely wonderful. We're, we're really pleased to have him. Boy, he can, he can turn out a short piece so fast. You know, when I write something, it turns out 2,500 words. When he writes something, it's <laughs> 600 words. Like, well, you know, I can really use that because that's not, I, I'm sort of verbose. <laughs> uh, uh, but we brought in, um, Lisa Beavers this year as our new graphic designer. And, uh, after a few months under her belt, I think she's found her groove. Uh, the magazine is looking better and better each month, I yeah, think. And, and, uh, fantastic. our, our printers, uh, do a wonderful job for us. Uh, um, uh, Johnson Press of America up in Pontiac, Illinois. Uh, they, they do a wonderful job with the printing. It goes out on nice paper and a sealed bag. And, uh, you know the, the cost. I think is is really reasonable for what we do. And and now we've got the the alternative of you know if if you're out of country, the you know the postage is ridiculous. But mm. you know if if you want to have access to the magazine without paying those fees, you can you know you can get a subscription to the magazine on our website. And not only the, the current issue, but every issue we've ever published. Yeah, I I have one. Jim has one, and uh, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. You have everything right there. What what I was gonna ask you is uh, what what are some of the main like what are the challenges of having a knife periodical like every month you have that's it <laughs> right it is periodical <laughs> right? it. in a nutshell it's every month I, uh, it would probably be off color to to reference a menstrual cycle but it's much like a menstrual cycle I, every I got month you. yeah <laughs> yeah every month I'm gonna be really cranky for a week. <laughs> but 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 you're gonna you know through through necessity you will find out amazing things <laughs> because you have to research something. I, I mean, your 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 magazine is very uh, uh, deeply researched, uh, yes, and and historically based. A lot of the articles are are either about modern interpretations of traditional knives or just basically historical and traditional knives. It takes a lot of research, and mm -hmm. um, so where do you get your information is it a lot of firsthand? You've been in the in the business for twenty three years. Have you met a lot of people? Well, uh, you know, I I write some of those articles occasionally, but we we rely upon a whole you know squadron of uh, freelance authors who have written many of which have written for us for years, or sometimes we have people uh, just come out of the blue um, who collect one area, have expertise in that area. And, and more expertise than anyone else would. So we encourage them to put their words on paper, tell us mm. what they know. And, you know, if they need a little assistance, we can turn it into an article. So most of our writers of the, of the article content are not necessarily even writers. They're knife experts. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I can, I can take something that is no literary masterpiece and turn it into something legible, you know, right, right, readable. Right. right. You're not, uh, you're, you're not going to those guys uh, for their writing. You're going right. to them for their knowledge on. Right. And, yeah. and that is a challenge as far as generating material goes. Cause often you have a, a fella come in and write his one article and he's done. Um, so now you got to go find another one. But, uh, you know, we, we have some of the most respected people, uh, in practically any field you can imagine, whether that's military knives with Frank Traska and, uh, uh Ron Fluck, Roy Shadbolt, uh, you know, Bowie knives. We have a bunch of different people, uh, <laughs> pocket knives. We have, you know, and, and writing for us right now, you know, we have Bernard Levine, who's been the, you know, the industry expert since writing for us since 70. Wow. Eat, I think, and and we have uh, you know Bruce Voiles and and Stephen Dick, who you know are both former magazine editors, highly respected, long term magazine editors, book authors, uh, writing for us. We you know when That's when they awesome. when they when their situations changed with where they were, they said, "Come, come, come here. We we will give you the freedom to do what you want to do and and be who you are." So. Uh, it's been kind of fun to to pull together people like that and to uh to be able to to present a, a magazine that i you know i think is unique from the others because of our coverage well you know the coverage is very broad in knife magazine and 
you know, frankly, uh, when when you see in a magazine the coverage of modern knives is mostly designed to generate advertising dollars, which is where the money is at. And you know, we address that area just like the other publications do. But you know, I this month's cover story is is on an antique Bowie knife, and mm. really the deal uh, that that led to the tr- change in ownership of this Bowie knife, uh, you know. The maker of that knife has been dead 150 years. He isn't running an ad. <laughs> wow. Um, there, there's no advertising revenue in military knives or yeah, antique right. knives or most of, you know, a high percentage of the things we write about. So it doesn't make commercial sense for another magazine to do it. But, you know, we're not another magazine. We can do whatever we want. Uh, you know, this is the only publication we do. We're, you know, we're, we're knife people. We're, we're not publishers. We're publishers only because we're knife people. Right. So you've been in the knife business for 23 years. What uh, what are your impressions of the knife business today? Uh, you know, what changes have you seen over, uh, you know, across that period of time? And uh, where do you see the knife world headed? I suppose that I, I came in at a very interesting time. You know, no, no one maybe realized that at the time. But the, the spy, you know, when I joined the Knife World staff in, in 97, the Spydercos were already out and Benchmade. And, you know, so we, we had tactical folders in development. Uh, and and we, we didn't know where they were going to continue to go. But we, we were seeing things like, you know, titanium and that. But, but it was all new. Uh, However, the probably the biggest change was, you know, I can remember it was either 97 or 98 uh, talking to Blackie Collins. In fact, it may have been two different years and two different events and, you know, showing us his new uh, 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 Meyer Co. Well, I'm going to forget what it is, but his assisted opener. It and mm-hmm. uh, the Ken Onion Kershaw were the first two assisted openers. So what do you think of that? I cut myself the first two times I handled it. You ever <laughs> handle a strut, a strut and cut? You ever, ever handle one of those? Uh, not that one in particular. No, uh, you, you <laughs> should look up a strut, a strut and cut. It, it, it operates on what a strut a cool mechanism. Name. Well, it's a strut mechanism that operates oh, okay. the blade. It's, and he was a motorcycle <laughs> guy. He designed the knife based on his Ducati. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was, it's a knife that, um, if you're used to traditional pocket knives as I was, the, uh, the point at which the blade snaps close is probably 20 degrees earlier than you oh, expected. Yeah. So that, like I said, not just the first time I handled it, but the first two times I handled it, I got cut. Um, but Blackie also, and I don't know if it was the same year or the next year that he, you know, he and Houston were great friends. And, and so, um, you know, I had the, the great pleasure of getting to know Blackie just a little bit. And he came to us for our opinion. He said, what, what do you think the reaction would be if we brought in some knives from China? And we said, well, we think, you know, you're probably out of your mind, or at least it's going to take a while before they accept it. So, you know, we saw this with Japan back in the 70s that Mm -hmm. initially the Japanese knives were, you know, were poor quality. I shouldn't say poor. They were medium quality. Mm -hmm. And and it took a while for them to get some traction. And by the time the mid 80s rolled around, they were making better knives better knives or, or better knives in, in particular genres than could be made over here. Right. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that exact thing, you know, in China. It's, it's happened during the period in which I've been here. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's sort of come in full circle now where we've got Chinese companies uh, uh, bypassing the, the middlemen like Columbia River over here and, and selling, you know, direct to the collector. So where's this going to go? Well, uh, I don't know, but uh, a lot of it is led by the uh, by the the connectivity the the internet has provided, and you know the the making of a, a smaller world, and you know it, it manifests itself in all sorts of unpredictable ways. But that that was that was a way I did certainly didn't <laughs> predict in you know ninety seven or ninety eight or whatever that was. Right back then, uh, the internet was just a way to like look up uh, the closest pizza joint. You know, it was like, <laughs> yeah, there, this, there, there's no future to this. <laughs> well, you knew there was some future, but you didn't know where it was going to go, and and to uh, see where it's gone from there, and and you know the different uh, possibilities it has offered to, in, to knife club. I mean, in '97, mm-hmm. knife shows were were still going strong with with no end in sight, and you know since then there. You know, there are a number of shows that are still very strong across the country, but there used to be a hundred of them a year. And I don't know how many there are a year right now, but it'd be, it'd be closer to 50. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's a different world and, and, uh, the, the collecting world is collecting different things than they did back then. I, I feel like there is a, uh, you know, I've been collecting knives since the late eighties. Well, since before that, but I got my first expensive knife in the late eighties, you know, uh -huh. and I feel like I've seen, um, things go way less tactical, way more pocketable. Uh, this is primarily how I feel. And I think, uh, others might feel this way, but if I'm going to be spending the money on this, uh, item that I'm going to obsess over and, and use sometimes, uh, I want to be able to carry it around with me. Oh, no you know? fooling. You can't uh, show it off if it's home in the safe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think that it, that's really led to this. I mean, it, it sounds so obvious. Uh, I, it's not uh, brain science here, but I feel like that's led to this surge in popularity over the last certainly five years, but definitely 10 years, uh, of pocket knives. And, and, and with every year, the innovations come a little bit more easily. You know, now mm -hmm. everybody's got bearings yes. and, and mm -hmm. titanium, you know, it used to be you, you only saw titanium with certain steels. And now you see titanium with some lower grade steels. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's like the, uh, the barrier of entry gets lower and lower with the internet. Yes. Yeah. And I feel like there are a lot more people. It, I, I feel like the community is just larger. But then again, uh, when I first started collecting knives, I was a totally unconnected kid. So I don't know. Maybe there was a big knife world happening then. It's, um, it's hard to know what the community is now because the community doesn't really interact them. I mean, they do online, but it's hard to track it. it it's not like the shows used to be where, you know, I can remember my first knife show in 1978 in Louisville. I, I was a kid and I was looking up and everybody's 10 feet tall and jammed together. And, and, uh, you know, it, it was a madhouse. Oh, it was, it was the greatest madhouse I'd ever seen in my life, but <laughs> it, it, it was incredible. And the, the, sh the shows for the most part are, are not like that anymore. Um, but there's all this activity online with the, you know, the, the, the forums and the, the blogs and all the, the collector type sites uh where collectors gather and, and you know interact together or people are just messing around out there buying and hoarding stuff and and not um and not interacting and i think the interaction is really important i i think that's something that we've lost to a degree I, you know for example uh you know we were discussing this weekend the the situation with antique bowie knives and how do you become a collector of antique bowie knives anymore uh i i think if you're interested in antique Bowie knives, the worst thing you can do is sit at home and try to collect them because mm -hmm. you know, you're you're going to buy fake after fake after fake. And where are you going to learn that you've just bought a fake? I can tell you how to tell the difference online. Or I shouldn't say I can tell the difference online. Yeah. But how are you going to learn it if I'm not there telling you that that's something you need to be watching? So the, the, if you if people who get out to shows can – bring things and talk about things and interact. And I can show you now, look at this and compare it to that. But if, if you've isolated yourself, buddy, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's a scalable concept across a lot of different areas. It's like uh, learning martial arts from a video or, or YouTube. You can't, uh, you know, yeah, sure. It, it might help you get further along than where you are if you have some, some base, but you know, there, there are certain things that most likely you're not going to learn any other way than getting in there with someone who knows and, uh, you know, that you can really pick up what they know, you know. Mm -hmm. So how do people, uh, how do you, okay, if you're going to do some trades or, or whatnot, how do people find you and find out what you have to trade? How does that work? How does your, are you always trading stuff? Me personally? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I am. But, um, to be quite honest, uh, when people try to contact me through the magazine or whatever to buy a knife, I, I'm really busy and I, I I'm not yeah. very good. I had a fellow, poor fellow, a friend of mine now down in Florida who pestered me for a good year, <laughs> making phone calls, leaving messages. I want to buy a knife from you. Oh, I'll get back to you. And I just, you know, finally I sold him a $5,000 knife or something, but you know, for me to unplug myself from the business to go make gotcha. a call. To call somebody, I just, I, I'm, I'm not equipped to do that. I don't have the time. And, and as much as I like, love knives, um, you know, I got a family. I have to unplug a little bit at the mm -hmm. end of the day and, and maybe I go plug back in after the 
the kid and the wife are in bed. I go back downstairs and work till some stupid hour uh, <laughs> d- dealing with, you know, the magazine or doing fun stuff or, or, or whatever. But um, we all need a little time away, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's no doubt. No doubt. So tell everybody how they can find Knife Magazine, the best way to get connected uh, with the content you produce and uh, that you and Clay are putting out. Uh, let everyone know about that. Well, we're we're pretty easy to find. We're at knifemagazine.com online, and, and uh, if you're listening to this, I guess you're connected. Uh, you can also reach us at uh, 1-800-828-7751. But if you go to our website, you can our homepage uh, is Clay's uh, uh, never-ending news feed, and you can sort of check out uh, a sample of what we do there for free. You get uh, some examples of things that, that you would find in the magazine. There's always sample articles there. And uh, there's a, a, a fair portion of our website is free content. Uh, if you go into what we call the vault, you will find some interesting things there. And uh, we'll lead you to places that maybe you can't quite get to until you're a member. But uh, there's plenty of samples there to see what we're all about. Yeah, and it is so worth so worth subscribing to Knife Magazine. It is uh, an endless font of research and just fun for knife nerds like myself. And I'm assuming you, Mark, but I'm not going to cast the news version. <laughs> I try to make something that, that I want people to read because I would want to read it myself. Exactly. That, that's that's the basic idea. Well, Mark Zaleski, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure meeting and speaking with you. Well, thank you, Bob. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, maybe you'll let me back one of these days. Uh, <laughs> if you can filter out all the bad words and, and uh-uhs. <laughs> <laughs> not too many uhs. And I heard no, ba- no bad words. So you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> All Thanks, right. Mark. Thank you, Bob. The Knife Junkie is online at thenifejunkie.com. Back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Great interview, Bob, with uh, Mark, the uh, editor of Knife Magazine. Just uh, a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, really. I was very interested in hearing about his uh, folding hunting knife collection, similar to the knife that you got that uh, that I helped you rehab. Um, just just an, an example of a sub collection of his. And I, I just think. Uh, I don't know. It's just very, very cool. But that's his collection. His career, you know, spans quite a bit. And um, just in talking to him made me realize that if you immerse yourself enough in something, even if it's just an interest or even if it's just a hobby, and by just, I mean something you're not getting paid for, but you really invest yourself in it, it can it can open up opportunities to you that you never imagined. And uh, Mark Zaleski seems to be an example of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Several opportunities he talked about in that interview that came about. So, yeah, if uh, you want to see all the uh, great writing, the gorgeous pictures, all the content, uh, they've got a great calendar of knife shows and knife club meetings as well right on their website. Go to knifemagazine.com, knifemagazine.com. That's a uh, that's a great resource uh, for anyone in the knife world. Yeah, it's like uh, a big, beautiful, illustrated it's like the old Life magazine, right? Giant and beautiful. Mm, right. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for uh, this edition, this uh, pre-Christmas edition of the uh, Knife Junkie podcast, if you will. But uh, don't forget, the supplemental is coming out on Christmas Day. You can listen on Christmas Day as a present or over the next day or two if you want. But we'll have a few messages from some listeners along with uh, Knife Junkie Holiday Wish as well as some other knife news. That'll be coming out on Christmas Day. You can listen then or later in the week, but that's going to be our midweek supplemental issue or episode that we will release on Christmas Day. So uh, if you don't get a chance to listen to that on Christmas, definitely want to say Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to to you, and thank you for listening. Yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and uh, let this new year be an excellent one uh, filled with prosperity and love. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.